my practice, uh, about 30% of my practice are women who have uh, strong respecters, either a uh, first degree relative or they've had a biopsy which shows significantly abnormal cells. So about a third of my practice is, are high risk women. I see them every three months. <clears throat> I do that for a couple of reasons. Because they get the reassurance of having a professional examine their breasts. I get to examine their breasts regularly, so I'm very familiar. It's not once a year. I haven't seen these breasts in a year. I've seen these breasts okay, for years. Uh, the other thing is that the whole field of breast cancer research is relatively dynamic, and things change. New things happen. And so if I'm seeing these women relatively frequently, more than once a year, they can ask me whether deodorant causes breast cancer and underlying cause, whether that causes breast cancer. And then I can tell them, oh, guess what? Birth control pills are a good one carcinogen. Um, someone who has a strong family history and has risk factors uh, should be followed clinically, I think, more closely than once a year. Uh, it's been shown that digital mammography is probably better. Digital mammography is not really good for everyone, but in that uh, group of women, it's probably beneficial. And then uh, I'm particularly um, supportive of MRI, uh, not as a screen for everyone, but certainly in the high risk patient. MRI is very sensitive, so it picks up all kinds of static. So, it's, and so you don't really want to be picking up a lot of static in a large population, whether it's most of the women are not going to get breast cancer, but if you have a woman whose clock is ticking, like Melissa told me, tick, 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 right? Uh, then you want to be very aggressive in terms of surveillance. So for that woman, I need digital mammography and MRI are very good. Have fun getting the insurance companies that they want. That's a big Russell. Yeah. Um, it's hard. I mean, I get on the phone with them, and I'm like, you know, if you do the MRI and you pay out $1,500 and the MRI is benign, I can really, with 99% accuracy, say to this woman, we don't have to do a biopsy, we really can wait, this is, this is probably nothing. If you don't pay for the MRI, I have to do a biopsy. You're going to pay more for that, it's going to cost you four grand. She has to have surgery, okay? She gets a scar. What's up with that? So it can be an argument. Forty minutes. Forty minutes. It's enough, I guess, to really get the blood flowing. Okay? You got, you know, six pints of blood in your body and uh, your heart's moving it around pretty well, but your heart uh, has to make decisions based on needs in the periphery about where the blood's going to go. Just like you get your paycheck, you have more bills, then you've got money, and you have to decide who gets paid. So the heart has to decide who's getting the blood. It takes a while to get the blood circulating to areas, and maybe even circulating to the breast. Who knows, maybe 40 minutes of exercise followed by 10 push-ups <laughs> is the thing to do. But it takes a while to get the blood flowing. 40 minutes. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a hard sell in Kuwait, where women are getting it in their 20s. And it's just happened in the past 11 years. Um, there are some women uh, in their 30s and 40s who have no family history. And we have the gene, and we've tested them for the gene, and they don't have the gene. Thousands of them. Thousands of them. So, from one perspective, you could look at the entire population, which is the argument that is used in terms of whether the insurance company wants to pay for a mammogram for women in their 40s. Well, there's not a lot of breast cancer in women in their 40s, right? So let's not pay for it. Because we're going to spend all this money doing mammogram screening, what, to find three women with breast cancer? Maybe we save their life, it's not possible. But as far as the insurance company is concerned, the woman, on the other hand, is very happy to be safe. So there is some truth that. Women who have a genetic predisposition, because they carry the gene from the day they're born, before that, from the time that it's just one single egg, there's the message. 
BRC, one BRC, two, a P53 abnormality. So every cell in their body contains that mutation. And they hit uh, menarche, they go through puberty, now they're ovaries that make the estrogen, driving replication of these cells that we know are headed for the border, right? Remember Chris Christopherson's song, You're Headed for the Border, You're Bound to Cross the Line? So if you've got the gene and you're making estrogen, you're taking birth control pills, you're having pregnancies, whatever, sure, you might get your breast cancer early. As a matter of fact, women who have the BRCA1 gene, 50% of them will get their breast cancer by the age of 50. So your physician is somewhat true. Uh, I think there's another facet to the statement to you, which is, don't worry. Um, I don't know, I mean, my perspective, I'm a breast cancer surgeon, so I know I have breast cancer. I'm on the alert. I'm on the alert. I think that in the premenopausal patient, it's not entirely the genetic. And if you look at the birth control data, it doesn't appear to be genetic. It appears in some women to be directly related to using the birth control. Uh, Fluid tumors are interesting tumors. Um, and by and large, they don't run in families. Um, they're very likely related to some genetic abnormality, but probably not something that seems to be passed down. She's disabled. Your sister is? Yes. She has awful fibrosis. So I don't know if that If there's a relationship, if there's some sort of genetic life in right. going on. Yeah. Um, Fluid tumors are like benign fiber adenomas. Uh, except for once in a while, a Fluidis tumor can actually have some aspect to it which is quite malignant. Um, and that really relates to the, the DNA. Uh, you know, you're familiar with the DNA. The DNA is, you know, it carries the messages. It carries, really, you can think of it, it carries the recipes. It's as if everybody uh, has their own personal recipe book, right? So Elizabeth David's, you know, Mediterranean cooking, that's Elizabeth David's cookbook. So every cell in your body contains a copy of your cookbook. Right? And then depending on where those cells are, if they're in the liver, they're reading the chapter of liver recipes. Right? But every cell as a cookbook. And if you've got a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, then that is in one of those recipes. So instead of adding salt to, um, you know, maybe chocolate cake, uh, you add cream of corn. You need the salt. You substitute it, you don't get the same result. Um, and then what's interesting is every time the cell divides, you have to make a copy of the cookbook, right? Each cell gets its own copy. Well, in the translating, okay, just like the old monks, why is the Old Testament so different depending on where you pick up the archival material? So every time someone has to transcribe something, there's room for error. So every time a cell has to make a copy of the cookbook, there's room for error. Oh, and particularly if you live in New Jersey, or in the United States, okay? and you have all of these viruses that are coming in, like can insert themselves. Cut the C inserts itself into the liver recipes, and later it gives you liver cancer. Okay? HIV inserts itself into red blood cells, and later it gives you non Hodgkin's lymphoma, Kaposi's sarcoma. That's what viruses do. They get in your recipe. So when the cells divide, every time you give them more and more of an opportunity to make mistakes. And the more mistakes they make, the more they've got a chance to put it together and make them answer. Well, ladies, uh, we have to wrap up. Uh, it's time to go. Thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it.